Good evening. <clears throat> Let us start tonight's service by <clears throat> reciting the Sunday Congregational Prayer. The words will be shown on the screen. We offer our salutations to the all-loving being who endows all beings with consciousness. We meditate on the Lord, who is the origin of the universe. Lord, thou abidest in all. Thou art all. Thou assumest all forms. Thou art the origin and goal of all. Thou art the self of all. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss. Salutations unto thee. May the world be peaceful. May the wicked become gentle. May all creatures think of mutual welfare. May their minds be occupied with what is spiritual and abiding. May our hearts be immersed in selfless love for the Lord. Peace, peace. Peace be unto all. So we are continuing with our guest, uh, <clears throat> guest lecturer series um, while Swami Yogatmananda is in uh, India. Our speaker tonight uh, is a professor of mechanical engineering at UMass Dartmouth, specializing in robotics, dynamics, and vibrations. So we hope he will share with us some good vibrations tonight. <laughs> He is also a member of the Indic Studies, uh, part of the UMass program, where he organizes and conducts many programs highlighting the heritage uh, of India. Uh, his message, as it appears on the UMass website, is that spiritual knowledge holds the secret to solving many modern problems. And it is our duty to bring forth Vedic and Puranic information to benefit the entire world. His chosen topic tonight is Sister Nevita, her 150th birth anniversary. So please welcome to, uh, guest speaker for the evening, T.K. Roy. Namaskar. Thank you, Chet, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, you forgot to tell that I am not currently working for UMass Dartmouth. I am a retired faculty now for quite some time. So all the vibrations that you were expecting are all silent right now. <laughs> but we can regenerate those things ourselves, I guess. Now, this lecture that I'm going to give today was actually, I would consider a self-inflicted wound on me. <laughs> it, it so happened that uh, one of these gatherings that we meet here, I was sharing the table with uh, Swami Jogatmanandaji, and I just said, Swamiji, this is the 150th year of uh, Sister Nivedita's birth anniversary. We did so much for the Swami Vivekananda, and uh, I mean, she's not less of a personality, so why don't we do something about it? And he said, no, we did something. And then I said, well, you know, we should still do something, at least, you know, this is 28th October is coming, I mean, which is already gone. He said, just coming, and uh, we should do something. I said, why don't you do it? I said, no. <laughs> I mean, I would say that let us do it, not why don't we do it. <laughs> but somehow that talk ended and then said, well, uh, Sravani can help you with slides and all that thing. And Sravani knows, he's smiling. <clears throat> and then she, Sravani said, no, 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 uh, I will not be helping you, but there will be somebody else. But that's how it ended and I thought, hey, since Sravani was not interested in doing anything, and I said, the the load is off my chest, and I really forgot about it. So I said, but it is only when your flyer came in the mail. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> then I said, and the day before or two days before, I had seen Sukalan, and I said, what is your program when Samiji is gone, what is happening? And he said, he never mentioned that I was doing it. And of course, he also did not know, probably. Then I said, well, and then probably that 
that trouble is gone. But when I saw the flyer, then I saw, well, now the sword is hanging. So, so we started to look for some information on, on Sister Nivedita. But uh, definitely Sister Nivedita has been on my mind for some time because some of the things that I probably read here, maybe I picked up some book in the library here, letters of Sister Nivedita and all those things. And just going through few pages, it amazed me the amount of uh, energy that came out from her words. It just to tell you how much she loved India and how much she wanted to do for India. This, you know, we had learnt in Bengal, you know, Sister Nivita, Bhagini Nivita, we heard all those things while growing up. But uh, maybe some few pamphlets here, there, some small articles in newspaper, uh, nothing more than that. We had not really delved into the life of Sister Nivedita and what she contributed for the country and for India as a whole, uh, Hindu womanhood and all those things. So it, it really amazed me the, and the fiesty nature of this lady when she attended some of the uh, meetings, how she would come with so much force like a true lioness. That is how Swami also introduced her. So that's how the whole thing started. And I said, okay, let me look at it. So I talked to Sukalan, and Sukalan was kind enough to give me one of the, uh, the books that he said that is a very authentic uh, biography on this. So this, this helped me quite a lot. Thank you, Sukalan, for that. And I was flipping through the pages of this thing. <coughs> made some notes. Before that, I had uh, some uh, booklet that I might have purchased in India, so I, I glanced through the pages of this thing. So this is a good summary of uh, her life in short, but it does not go through the details. So today, I'm just going to summarize some of the things that I personally think that uh, as uh, people of Indian origin and others and who love India, how much she had done for the sake of country, India and Hindu uh, religion as a whole. Initially, uh, she started uh, her beginning contact with the Swamiji, that's where the her uh, initial contact with uh, Hindu religion and all those things started. It was, <coughs> let me flip the slide here. Uh, yeah, so it was, Swamiji was visiting England at that time. It was October of 1895. And at that time, he was giving lectures on uh, various topics on Vedanta philosophy. Uh, Sister Nivedita at that time was uh, told by one of her uh, friends, not actually a drawing teacher, uh, drawing teacher, that there is a Hindu yogi who is giving a lecture and the drawing teacher, uh, let me see, it is this slide on the next one. Uh, it's the go back to the go back, oh. Oh, I see, I'm going the other way. Yeah. Okay. Meeting the sannyasi. Family background. I think that's where we start, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, but anyway, 1895, October, uh, that's where uh, the drawing teacher uh, informed her that there is going to be a lecture. 
and it was uh, in that meeting that he saw Swamiji for the first time. And a gentleman, very poised, sitting in a saffron robe, a sannyasi, and she listened to her lectures, and that's where she got really impressed by the clear-cut exposition of thoughts that Swamiji was able to do that. And she attended all her lectures after that. But let me begin with some of the background of uh, uh, Elizabeth Noel. Her name is Margaret Elizabeth Noel. She was born October 28, 1867. That's what I was telling you that when I was telling Swami Yogatmananda that October 28 was just around the corner. And as you can see, it is 150 years. So it would be a perfect opportunity for us to celebrate that occasion. She was born in the uh, small village town, Dunganan, in the northern part of uh, Ireland. Her father is Samuel Richmond Noble and mother Mary Isabel Noble. These are the names, but actually her <coughs> grandfather, uh, he moved from Scotland. These are the families who migrated from Scotland and settled into uh, Manchester, that area of England, uh, in the Northern Ireland. And that's where she grew up. Uh, it's a small family. Uh, her father was also a priest. Grandfather was also a priest. So that background was there. We have to remember this is the background in which she grew up. So her grandfather being a priest, father being a priest, and it was the basic Protestant, Catholic, uh, Protestant Christian uh, followership they were following at that time. Her father died when she was very young, about 10 years old or so. So she did not have much interaction with her father as per se, as a, uh, as a young child, but even in 10 years, because she was very brilliant, and uh, she could pick up a few things that, uh, you know, that came from her father, the priest. Uh, she attended some of the lectures also, went to the church with, her, with him many times. So she had picked up some of the thoughts uh, that came from her father. But it was mostly during the summers, her maternal grandfather, who was Hamilton, that's where they spent most of the time, both she and her younger sister and her younger brother, Richmond. So they used to spend time there her maternal grandfather was a very strong revolutionary kind of a thing that he had that Irish uh, feeling of independent uh, Ireland and all those things because they didn't like the subjugation of England over them. So those things, really, some of the things form the background of Elizabeth Noble when as a child. And you will see that thing, that particular nature, just the characteristic of like a being independent. You know, many times in her life, later on, she said, don't try to frighten me. I still have the, the blood of a free Irish woman. So these, these are the kinds of things. She carried that into her life in the latter part. So that was one of the things. The being born in a Protestant uh, Christian family, that uh, definitely provided her. And she went to a school which was uh, a church boarding school. Uh, and that's the way they had to be because the father had died. So the mother, mother thought that the best way to educate them would be to send them to a church school where they can reside and they can live the life of a disciplined uh, dormitory life 
of a Christian uh, style. And there um, she also picked up the habit of living uh, mostly like a discipline, like get up early in the morning and all those kinds of things. So those things later in her life of her, uh, when she, she came to India and accepted the uh, sisterhood in the Ramakrishna mission, that helped her to, to uh, accept that life. Even though there were many difficulties, I mean, I'm, you know, you get to understand the difficulty that she had to do to adjust herself when she came to India. But that was one of the helps of her upbringing that came. But also along with came some of the difficulty because being born in a Christian uh, Protestant family, you got uh, some thoughts about the religion. And when she went to India, and she had to struggle with the with with Kali, the image of Kali and all those things. That became a hindrance. But you know, those are the kinds of things that I'm just trying to say. That what the background mattered to her when she came to India. <clears throat> she studied literature, broad areas of uh, uh, literature, music, arts, physics and botany. And these are very important also. She studied those things. Uh, she was afterwards, after completing the school, immediately, uh, because the financial condition of her mother was not very strong, with the father being absent, so she took up a job of a teacher. So she started teaching. And later on, uh, she actually started a school of her own. And uh, at the age of 17, when in 1884, she started her own school and, you know, she taught uh, different subjects. Uh, and later on, she finished also her college education with Halifax College, which was a Congressional Church chapter part of it. And basically, she stayed there and, and taught the, uh, the students but as she was growing up, she uh, started another sesame club in that same area, where, which was a big club. In fact, you would say at that time, the, uh, all the intellectuals of that time, they used to meet at that, that particular place. Uh, some of the big names, uh, George Bernard Shaw, uh, Huxley was there. You know, so these these great minds were there, and she could interact with those guys. Just think about her. She's just like a 25, 22 year old girl, but she also developed a skill for writing. Her writing was very powerful. She also was a very big orator. So all these things were just happening when she was growing up and running that school uh, in England. So this is in the middle of that time when Swamiji visited England. And we know, I, was, I mentioned about that 1895 October when Swamiji came, she went to visit. So she was at that time still struggling with the, with, uh, with being intellectual. She questioned the things that one finds in religion. You know, we all do. We, when you hear about something, you want to reason and find out, is that true? Can it be true or no? So all, all of us have those kinds of questions. So many of the things that the Bible taught, uh, she could not probably uh, agree to many of the things intellectually. You know, of course, by faith, you will have to accept those things. But Intellectually, she was questioning uh, those things. Before that, also, what happened? The, she uh, she had a uh, small uh, period of romantic relation, like a young girl would have at that her age, and that relationship uh, did not mature. Finally, um, they uh, I mean the boy she fell in love with actually was captured by the earlier girlfriend of the boy. Boy had a earlier girlfriend, so, so kind of a thing. So those are the kinds of things that happen. It gives you a shock 
uh, kind of a sadness. So I, her mind was actually m more inclined in the spiritual directions. You know, so she was looking for something uh, to grab onto. And Swamiji came right on that time in the horizon. And her lectures, I mean, his lectures uh, impressed him. Then she continued to attend all her lectures. While Swamiji was there like, giving, giving the lectures, uh, she attended all the lectures of Swamiji when uh, he gave those things in London. But Swamiji had to return to America. And Swamiji returned back. She stayed in London. But this intervening period, when Swamiji was gone, also gave her some time to think and plan because all the things that Swamiji had told, she had not digested everything and it's very hard to digest those things. So she was trying to digest, but she was also trying to plan because Swamiji had some questions. Uh, I don't know if I have this slide. Uh, oh, this I mentioned. Oh, the slides are a little bit off center. This I have already gone through. This is the one drawing room, drawing teacher, 1885, yellow robe. Uh, yeah, so Swamiji uh, comes back uh, again in the April of 1896. And at this time, the intervening time, she thought about the things Swamiji had talked about, that we need some sincere people, sincere to the core, that who can, you know, give their life. So these things affected her and she had thought what she can do. And in 1896, when Swamiji came, uh, uh, Margaret went to her, and this time with a little bit more more uh, firmness in her tone that I am ready to work, master. And this is the time when she called Swamiji master, that kind of in her mind she had accepted that, you know, she, he could be the guru or the teacher for her. So, so at that time she attended all her lectures again, and this was a very rigorous training period. Swamiji uh, gave uh, four times a week uh, lectures on uh, Jnana Yoga at that time. He was giving, I think, the things on. And uh, she attended all those things very sincerely. On Fridays, it used to be question answers. She would be sitting there and asking questions in the second row. <laughs> those uh, interesting question answers. Sistine, uh, uh, yeah, Christ, Christine uh, was also next to her sitting. That was another you know, girl that used to be there. So she was interested. And she uh, went through all the lecture series, learned quite a lot. She had to struggle with the Maya problem. And Maya problem, in her own way, she resolved it, you know, eventually uh, what it is. So she was kind of ready to plunge in. But uh, this intervening, intervening period where Samiji had to leave again uh, and he went to India, uh, she was still planning as to what to do and in the meantime she was in correspondence with Samiji when Samiji came back to India. Um, correspondence was there. Swamiji knew that she has the potential that uh, what, you know, India needs. And actually Swamiji wanted somebody like her uh, uh, energy, enthusiasm, sincerity to work. Because Swamiji was envisioning that she would be a perfect woman for the education of women in India. Um, and rather than, uh, you know, working for another group, um, she, he wanted 
her to be coming to India if she decides to come, then serve the cause of Hindu woman. That was his planning. Interest of her uh, coming to India, initially Swamiji knew that it would be such a difficult thing for a Western woman to come to India and live in that kind of a situation where they, you know, you look at the, the weather condition itself, the food, the culture and all those things, to adjust to all those things would be tremendous. So she, he initially um, did not encourage the thoughts because once she comes to India and finds all those things, it might be very, very difficult. So she, he gave all those things that you make up your mind, you have to understand the difficulty under which you will be working, he wanted to make sure that she is completely ready to face any kind of difficulty that would come to her. And it's just not like that, come here and we will help you. But once you decide to come, yes, I will be with you all the way to help you. I'll be next to you to help you. So that decision in... Uh, Finally, it was taken and she came to India on 28th, uh, 28th January of 1988. So she lands in Calcutta and uh, Calcutta port and Swamiji was there to welcome uh, her. That day when she landed, uh, it was January, so it was the weather wise it was not really bad, but January weather in Calcutta is quite uh, nice. And uh, she was uh, given a room, the guest house room where she went. So uh, that day, the entry in her diary was victory. I have reached India. <laughs> Just one line. You know, you have, with all the journey uh, through the ocean, you can imagine the amount of uh, amount of travel time and the the uh, physical exertion on that thing. But she was looking forward to coming to India. So that's why it's a victory when she, she is so happy. <clears throat> Immediately after that, within a month, uh, 22nd February, uh, uh, she visited uh, Dakshineshwar. And as you know, Dakshineshwar is the uh, place where our Thakur Ramakrishna, that is the place of his uh, worship, uh, sadhana place, uh, where he spent most of his, actually, the life where he uh, received his, uh, mm -hmm. uh, all the um, enlightenment or whatever you call it, but we call him avatar, so he, he did not need it. But it was the place of sadhana, it was a kathor sadhana he did as a child of Mother Kali and on the, on the bank of uh, Ganges River. So Dakshineshwar, uh, how many of you have uh, traveled to India and visited uh, Dakshineshwar? Okay, quite a lot. How well, Prithis, you have not, you did not raise your hand, see that? You get to raise my. You were give, giving me conflicting information. I thought, how come he is not? <laughs> so Dakshineshwar is a, is a place where, uh, of course, he, she wanted to visit. Unfortunately, at that time, the orthodoxy of Hindu religion was so, being a Western. She was not allowed to go into the premises of the temple inside. So she had to satisfy her uh, just by from the outskirts, actually, and looking at Mother Kali only from distance. So think about that, you know, the, what kind of a uh, d disillusionment or disappointment she might have. But she came with all the excitement that I got to go and see. See, where our Thakur, you know, where did his sadhana, and Swami Vivekananda had told 
heard quite a lot about that place and how much time he had spent with his master because that was really some of the things that he always talked about, this, how much he loved to be with that old man <laughs> and how much he did argue and fight with him. Because Swami Vivekananda was a character, you know, that he wouldn't accept anything without yeah, really going into detail, fighting and doing that thing. Many of the things he argued with his uh, uh, with Thakur, all these things you are seeing is hallucination. Just think about it. You know. And he, this poor man, he thinks, what is this hallucination? He is telling me all that I am seeing and everything is hallucination, like the effect of some kind of a, um, hallucinatic uh, item like ganja or something like that. So she, he would go back to Mother Kali and she said, is that what is? He said, no, 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 Mother Kali would, you know, she said, no, whatever you are seeing is all. Okay. Then he would get angry. You don't come to me here, okay? okay? You don't come to and see me. You are ruining my <laughs> faith in Mother Kali. So that was the place that uh, Sister Nivita visited on uh, 11th March. Uh, Swamiji wanted Nivedita to be introduced to the people of uh, Calcutta, particularly in India as a whole. And she, he did it in a planned way because the thing is that she is a woman coming from west, uh, white skin woman, uh, Irish background, uh, to accept uh, that kind of a person into a Hindu society at that, you know, we're talking about 1800s, it would be a very difficult thing. So he wanted to break that shock and uh, make it a little bit easier so that the, the society would accept her in terms of that being a part of their member or community. So uh, he arranged a meeting in the Star Theater where the elites of the city, they were all there, and uh, where Swamiji said, uh, England sends her one of her gifts to us and that is how we present you know, Sister Nivedita at that time. And she spoke, I have some of the things that I wanted to, I don't think that I have it here on this slide. Uh, yeah, so on that uh, 11th March, it was the meeting <clears throat> After Swamiji introduced and all that thing, she also spoke at length. She gave a nice lecture, but just a brief uh, couple of lines from there. I have it here. Very nice. Yours is the conservatism of a people who have through that long period have been able to preserve the greatest treasures of the world. And it is for this that I have come to India to serve her with a burning passion for service. So this, you know, there are uh, the other things there, but this gives you the gist that sincerity with which she came to the people of uh, Calcutta. And people were impressed. Actually, when you say something with sincerity, it comes out. So it, the people understood that she is sincere. <clears throat> and rest of her life after that, you know, we see the rest of her life, the words that she spoke on that particular meeting were so true and sincere to every letter that the pronouncement she made that day with, with so much passion and sincerity to the core, a dedication that she had, the people accepted, and so it all it, it, things came out in the paper and so on. Therefore, one part of being accepted by the society was done in that 
particular meeting. So this was the second thing was <clears throat> that uh, Swamiji said, "How else I can make her acceptance by the society?" And she thought about Holy Mother. Holy Mother, if Holy Mother accepts Sister Nivita. And this was a big tre trepidation for Swami Vivekananda because he also did not. Because you think about Holy Mother uh, is a widow, Brahmin, very orthodox coming family. For her to accept somebody from West, uh, the, the way Westerners were thought of at that time, there is a term in Hindi or Bengali, mlecha, we call it mlecha. It's outcast kind of a thing. That means these people do not abide by the strict rules of our uh, purity and, you know, taking bath and things and all those kinds of purity in that sense. Uh, they are not uh, suitable for going into our temples, this kind of thing, mlecha, a little bit different. So being Mother, uh, Holy Mother, if she accepts, then I think probably Swamiji would find that that will be a little bit more. So, with hesitation and some trepidation, the world will introduce you to Mother, Holy Mother. And he took uh, two other girls uh, with, with uh, Holy Mother. Fortunately, Holy Mother was uh, full of welcome for these ladies and she, she uh, put them next to uh, her uh, bed, you know, that is the system you sit on the bed and uh, she also ate with them. This is a great thing that you, know, you think about uh, somebody, a uh, widow Brahmin uh, from a very conservative family, orthodox family, uh, to do that. So that was a big achievement. At that meeting she also asked, you know, that what is your name? And uh, she said, Elizabeth Margaret Noble. And she said, well, that's a big name for me. So I am, you know, I don't think that I will remember that. But I will call you Cookie. Cookie is the name. Cookie in Bengali word for a uh, little baby girl or something like that, you know, little daughter or something. So she was very happy and she was so happy and Nivita being very simple in her nature, she was full of joy that, oh, mother has accepted me. You know? The next day she would bathe in the Ganges River and she would say, everybody, do you know that Holy Mother has accepted me and called me Cookie? So she was just like a young child. So that's how uh, she was introduced to uh, India and Indian population, uh, Holy Mother accepting her. And then on 25th March, uh, uh, Swamiji gave her the uh, initiation and that was, uh, the initiation is the, the uh, vow of Brahmacharya. So that's an important step in the life of uh, any uh, monastic life. So uh, she was given uh, the name Nivedita. And Nivedita literally means the dedicated. It's something that Nivedan is a word that we say the Nivedan, you offer flower to God Nivedan. You know, just you are offering. So Nivedan is kind of you are being offered, but it is the dedicated person. And what she is being dedicated? She is being dedicated to the service of India. That is the idea of that. And, she, and that was Swamiji's term for her. And that's from the time that she became Sister Nivedita. On 25th March, she said, Go thou and follow him who was born and gave his life for others 500 times before he attained the vision of Buddha. And Buddha was a personality that uh, Swami Vivekananda was very fond of. Uh, he had uh, a, a vision of actually Buddha when he was a young 
um, boy uh, he, uh, and the story goes that uh, buddha himself personified in his room and so so he was very fond of buddha and he introduced uh, nivedita also to buddha to go on to that <clears throat> so the uh, after that there is a time that uh, no a little bit before that uh, think about this is uh, happening in the month of march then we have a time period here 12th november she sets up her school so this intervening period is a time where it is very hot summer you know the, the, the temperature in calcutta and particularly in india all over gets a little bit too high and it's coming from a cold country uh, from uh, england uh, it would be hard so swami ji had planned a tour of the mountains going to the himalayas and all those areas so he visited with and took them there there also he Uh, went to kashmir uh, and took these people with uh, with uh, him so sister nivedita was there and that's the famous uh, place where they visited in kashmir uh, amarnath which is the uh, place of shiva um, even now people go for pilgrimage it's a very very difficult uh, place to go to amarnath uh, there is always a problem particularly pakistan being in the area but at that time pakistan was not involved so we were fortunate so he visited amarnath and uh, oh, of course nivedita and all they went but one thing happened there when swami ji came out from amarnath he was radiant he was glowing and so something happened and uh, nivedita looked at him and said something that happened is yes i have been blessed that i have uh, uh blessing from uh, shiva that i can die at my own will that means ichha mrittu that means uh, that's a big boon actually you might say the well, why why not jump and kill yourself that would be another thing you can do that well, that's not but ichamritu is a, is a is a boon that you can cast your body off any time you desire uh, that's a very yogic power for somebody to have and swami ji had received that thing to think about it, this is these are the kinds of things that uh, may look like a story uh, somebody is telling but these things really happen and when we see when swami ji uh, leaves his body i think we will go go to that when we come to that point so she uh, opens the after coming from there and eventually they settled in calcutta and then so when she was very eager to do something about uh, about uh, swami ji's plan with uh, her uh, what am i going to do she said well we'll start the school a school for girls because that particularly that was the idea that you will be educating the women in india and what is the time thing so she she would be educating the women and that was the purpose that they started a girl school on 12th november they started that they rented a place <clears throat> small place uh, it was uh, 16 bos pada lane bag bazaar the northern part of uh, uh, calcutta uh, that was also um, part of her residence i mean uh, one one part she used to live there and the other part was used for the school small room the next day 13th november holy mother came to visit also now the school when when they had to go and look for 
students to get that it, it was another problem you used to get students to to you start a girls school but you need pupils to teach there that was a, a big problem and uh, so when some you said go and ask uh, the people and uh, arrange a meeting and ask the parents to uh, to give their daughters to your school so that they can be so she she arranged a meeting and all that thing but not anybody was coming forward unfortunately she wanted to have surprisingly swami ji had surreptitiously come from the behind and the back which sister nivedha was had had no knowledge and he had uh, a lot of people in that meeting sri m was there har mohan there was uh, and har mohan haldar he was there and couple of other people so nobody was still there willing to so swami ji was poking in bengali ut ut no get up get up uh, and tell the lady that you want to you know give your daughter it is not only good that you are a father but you got to also you know educate her but nobody was interested in the beginning because there was a little bit of a caution eh, if i give it to this white uh, skin girl a christian you know that's what you know, maybe she will convert her to christianity or something so kind of that apprehension was there but anyway uh, finally swami said <laughs> okay on behalf of harmohan he said hey this man uh, agrees to give <laughs> give his daughter so i mean swami ji volunteered his daughter his friend's daughter is okay she will not so that's how they got this school started <clears throat> and uh, the school uh, she was teaching a lot of stuff particularly for what is good for the girls education sewing teaching um, you know woolen weaving uh, of course uh, literature music uh, science all those things and she she already had a background of science and uh, you know physics and botany were some of the subjects this by the way uh, when uh, 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 sister nivita came that became also a part of her duty to go to the uh, to belur mat and teach the sanyasis uh, science courses so she was teaching those you know, botany and you know physics and things like that because the, swami ji wanted her to to give some lessons to the sanyasis also on the other hand she was also getting some uh, lessons in bengali because swami ji wanted that she sh- you should learn some bengali because without that you cannot communicate with people and uh, sadanand was the uh, person Sadananda was a uh, very uh, um, brave sannyasi i would say <laughs> he uh, very strong bodied with a, some military background so he was really good but she was very devoted uh, to whatever he was doing okay. he acted like a bodyguard for for uh, sister nivedha all through all through i mean that his life is really something but he he used to teach uh, uh, sister nivedita some bengali lessons he so, uh, learn few bengali words to pick up and communicate so that's how the, the thing started with that however uh, nine uh, in the middle of uh, in the middle of 1899 this was in 1998 uh, in the summer of 1899 this plague broke out and uh, that took a whole lot of uh, effort to do things for the area so in bag bazar area where they were there uh, swami ji said we need to dedicate ourselves because we were a mission so we need to um uh, help the people in plague and so calcutta plague they started a committee uh, he she became the uh, secretary and 
she used to write in papers and all those things we need, but not too many people were coming. So eventually, uh, she came to the street herself with uh, with broomsticks and with basket and cleaning the streets of Bagwaja. Seeing that some young men, they found that uh, you know it was insulting for them that you know, lady from outside is coming and helping. So they came, but they did a very good job at that time and helped the. They play, but she was very after that uh, very tired also and needed rest and uh, she took some time off from there. But later on, <coughs> they had to. Um, and Swamiji had planned to leave for USA. I think it was the time when uh, they also needed money for the school. It was uh, more difficult to run this school the financially it was not possible so she said well maybe I'll come with you and then uh, get some money for the school so they went uh, uh, oh, she also went with Swamiji and at that time Swami uh, uh, another Swami who is that uh, Turiyananda accompanied thank you Turiyananda accompanied and they came they first came to uh, London, where uh, they went. So Nibeta was very happy that uh, she is back again, and uh, meeting mother was a very uh, comfortable feeling for her. And meeting her sister there, uh, younger sister, uh, younger sister is May, so she was there, and her younger brother Richmond. So that was a good time with them, but the thing is that Swamiji had to go to America after that, so she, he left. But in, during that time, there is an interesting thing that happened. Uh, the younger brother, Richmond, <coughs> you know, one of these days he said, you know, Elizabeth is uh, doing some tyranny here with us, all these things. What is this tyranny? And so she, he... Uh, he told Swamiji, because Richmond was very friendly with Swamiji, and Swamiji's nature was like that. So he said, what is the matter? He said, my sister has imposed the laws of Hindu in, our, in the family. So what is that? So I have, we, we have stopped from eating beef anymore. So <laughs> Swamiji laughed, he said, really, she has made some strict rules here. So that afternoon, Swamiji took Richmond with him and took to a restaurant and ordered a beef steak. So, you know, yeah, well done, so, eat my boy. You know, so what Nivita has taken, I'm giving back to you. So that is name. But after that thing, uh, her her younger sister May was supposed to be married, so she wanted to stay there in England. Swamiji and uh, these people, they went, went to USA and they went to Ridgely, uh, Ridgely Manor, that's where they spent the time there. Mm. And that was a good time, they had, uh, Swamiji had good rest there. But immediately after the marriage, when, when the marriage was done, uh, she also went back to, uh, to USA. And during that time when they toured, she was looking for some money in the U.S., but unfortunately uh, money was not coming, not too many people, because she, what she was trying to do is to collect money for the Hindu women. That was the, uh, the message that she was saying that Hindu, you got to contribute for the Hindu women. And she held many lectures. One of the lectures, uh, that was organized in Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. I was just trying to look for that lecture. That lecture, she was trying to impress on the people to contribute for the uh, Hindu woman, for, for the, and uh, Swamiji was sitting in the back uh, of that. She was so uh, fervent and uh, beseeching of the crowd 
that Swamiji was moved that how much this woman has converted herself from inside out for the sake of the Hindu woman, that transformation really. Even Swamiji was amazed by the transformation. That So in the back, Swamiji wept after listening to her lecture. You know, that was the kind of sincerity with which came up. But unfortunately, she could not collect much money from the U.S. travel that she had. It was just some few uh, dimes and bits and some dollars came, but not much. But she, uh, she went back again to, to England after that thing, and Swamiji came back to India <clears throat> because Swamiji himself was having uh, some health problems and uh, other stuff, and she had, he felt that India is calling me, so I must go back, so he, he came back. But she stayed in England at that time for some time. <clears throat> Let me see if I have Sivadarshan what he talked about. Uh, this comes later in Road to Brahman Ramaj. Uh, <clears throat> this when when she goes to yeah, goes to India, then she had this uh, Swamiji said that you know you cannot work in India without um, having interaction with the Brahman Samaj. Brahma Samaj was the elites, the people at that time who really dealt with a uh, lot of things in uh, India. Uh, they were the people who were uh, in the forefront of science, uh, literature, arts, and all those things. So, yeah, Ravindranath Tagore, uh, J.C. Bose, Devendranath. And looking at the clock, I have to really expedite myself. Now, Devendranath, so he, she is the one who organized a meeting with Devendranath Thakur. Devendranath Thakur was father of Rabindranath Thakur, and he was one of those founding fathers of Brahma Samaj, Raja Ram Rai and Devendranath. <coughs> so she met, uh, met with Devendranath Thakur and uh, told her that Swami uh, is interested in seeing you, Swami Vivekananda. And he eventually said, yes, I remember Vivekananda uh, when he was a young boy, so he came to me one day. I would be glad to meet him, so bring him here. So when uh, Nivedita mentioned that to uh, uh, Swamiji, Swamiji was very happy. He said, oh, yeah, that will be good because we want to have good relations with the Brahma Samaj. So he said, look, just uh, set an appointment very quickly and I would be glad to go there. And uh, so, so they, they finally went to meet uh, in Tagore's house. Uh, and at that time, uh, that uh, Devadanath was very old. Uh, but he was a very uh, yogi type of person. So, so uh, Swami Vivekananda had a had an earlier meeting with him, and he, Swami Devendranath remembered that yes, I have met him before when he was a young boy. Uh, how did he meet? He was uh, in the Ganges, his in a houseboat, and as if you remember, Swami Vivekananda as a young boy, he would be looking for who have you seen God? Have you seen God? So that was the spirit. So he knew that Brahma Samaj, this man also, he is doing these kinds of things, looking for, you know, uh, God, and so maybe he will have the answer. So he jumped into the river and went into, in his wet clothes and into the, uh, into uh, Dibandhanath's uh, house in which he was meditating. And suddenly he said, oh, I said, I just want to find out, have you seen God, or can you show me God, and all those things, or Vedas are true, and all those things. Then he, uh, at that time, he said, no, I am still struggling in that dualism, but I see in your eye that you will have the vision, you have the eyes of a yogi. So he had kind of some kind of a premonition looking into the boy's eyes. So this time when, when he came, after his visits from USA, when all his name was very popular, you know, in Chicago speech and all those things, she was popular. So he told Swamiji that I have 
read a lot about your achievements, what you have done, what are the things you have been talking about, and I have read them, uh, read them with pride. So, so Swamiji was moved, but he was also very shy. He didn't want to pay much attention to it. He just, okay, I want to uh, express my pronouns to you. He had given a rose. <clears throat> but he had the blessings, and then the Tagore family became friendly with him, and eventually uh, many Tagores came, and a lot of the people, Sarlagos and all those people came, and Swamiji wanted to leave and go to Belurmat, but uh, they wouldn't. Finally, he met all the, all the Tagores in that family. He said, the kind of a good rapport with that. And then eventually, uh, Swamiji said, come and visit Dakshineshwar. So there was a visit by, by them to Dakshineshwar, visiting Dakshineshwar Kali Temple, all those things. So it looks like the things were becoming very good there with the Brahmo Samaj and the uh, Swami Vivekananda's group, Parke Mission. Uh, Sarla Ghosh came. But after they left, uh, I thought, uh, you know, the th things are patching up. Two days after that visit, uh, there was a letter from Sir Lakos that I, we cannot reconcile with your uh, worship of Kali, the image Kali, because that is what was bothering them. So eventually, they, uh, uh, that relation, Sister Nivida cried. She really was shocked. She thought that she had patched up that, uh, you know, that crack between the Brahmo Samaj and the Rakhi Mission. Uh, you tell me when to stop, I guess. Uh, huh? It's almost time, right? Okay. Uh, there are more things to talk about. I mean, I get uh, distracted by just mentioning one thing or the other. But this is a life uh, that is worth studying. And that actually uh, put me into uh, the talk that I had started with Yogananda Ji, is that the, her life is worth studying. Uh, there, is, there were not too many good books have come about. There is one book, Lok Mata, um, in Bengali, in five volumes or four volumes. Uh, that uh, Shankari Prasad Bosu has done a good job, so we want to read that also. But I would uh, beseech you all to read the life of this great lady. And uh, only thing I can tell you is just a couple of lines that I have to summarize, and I thought I'll put it down. <clears throat> It is the, is the passion of this, uh, this marvelous lady. Uh, what sincerity to the core, what dedication for a foreign born and brought up in altogether another country with different customs, culture, the food, and the environment to transform herself inside out to serve the cause of India. It was her promise, her faith, her love, and respect for Swamiji's every word that she carried out in her rest of her life. It is hard to fathom the difficulties she faced and sacrifices she made to keep her promise. And for her true love for the people of India, Indians and India as a whole nation, we owe a great deal of gratitude and reverence to this great lady of many talents, courage, and spirit a human being of great magnanimity and benevolence. India has failed to give her the proper, at least to my thinking, I, I think that we do not have uh, enough recognition of her. Many of her are not even aware of how much she has done for India. The proper recognition of her many and varied contributions in the fields of education, arts, science, spirituality, social reforms, and other things. And, and including the freedom from the British colonial rule. That was one of the things that you know, I was supposed to talk about, but we kind of ran out. Maybe on another occasion we won't have the opportunity to do it. <laughs> but there are lots of things to talk about, so thank you so much. I didn't realize the time went so fast. What? Sister Nivita, oh yeah. On this special occasion, that is true. On this uh, special occasion when we are assembled to pay our homage to her on her 150th birth anniversary, let's all stand up and bow our heads, if we would do that, uh, in reverence to this great lady and shout together, 
शिष्ट निवेदिता की जय भगिनी निवेदिता की जय विक्ट्री टू शिष्ट निवेदिता एंड आई हैव फेल टू गिवन इवन ए ग्लिम्स ऑफ हर लाइफ दैट इज मी my god okay. <laughs> that is only thing that i have contributed originally here but i i sincerely want that you know you would be impressed by her life and teachings all right oh question and answer okay oh you need a questions no i don't know i'm um if you have any question answer i would be uh, glad to answer some if i can but i know many of you are more knowledgeable about her life uh, that but uh, it is a fascinating life uh, and uh, i would encourage people to read on her i know prithish probably has studied quite a lot on that sukallan has is, is good all right do you have any questions or not are you going to read let me go that it we are <laughs> all right thank you Thank you TK for some inspiring words on a truly great life and inspiration to all of us. Friday there will be a video show on Sri Ramana Maharshi. Um there's an upcoming spiritual retreat on Saturday December 2nd that will be given by Swami Yogatmananda. The theme is learning to breathe. Prior registration is required. $20 if uh by November 24th and uh after which it goes up to $30. Um so I think that covers all of the major announcements. So, we'll have the closing prayer. <clears throat> May the divine who is father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, great spirit of the Native Americans, Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us and grant us abiding understanding and all-consuming divine love. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Of course, there'll be soup supper following um the RT. And you'll have a chance to meet TK at the uh, back of the chapel as we as is customary.